welcome to Off The Shelf Reviews. I'll never look at Jurassic Park the same way again. And I'm Gary. And today we're going to review and discuss Possession, which released in 1981. Written and directed by Andrzej Zulowski. Ian, why don't you give us the synopsis for Possession? Well, the story follows Mark, played by Sam Neill, who has just come home from maybe a war or at least a long time away from his family. He finds that his wife is planning on leaving him and spends a lot of the movie trying to work out the reasons of why, where the love has gone and if he is still able to maintain a relationship with her and his son. But as the movie goes on, we realise we have no idea what the fuck's going on. I didn't really know much about this director at all. I think no, this is the first no. time we've uh, we've come across this. Oh, go go! Yes, definitely is for me. I think a Polish uh, director who had released a couple of films before this one in 1971. He released the third part of the night. Okay, yeah. And then a year later, in 72, he released a film called The Devil. Oh yeah. Then in 1975, he released a film called The Most Important Thing, Love. Yeah. Now, and then eventually he would get to Possession. But there was a bit of a gap between his previous film and this one. And that was because he was having a lot of problems in his in his native town, his native uh, country, Poland. Uh, they were not very happy with his films. And they pretty no. much stopped him from making films. And so he ended up leaving, yeah. going to Germany. Then he ended up in France, where he ended up continuing studying. Before he ended up making Possession in, in Germany. And when Possession was completed... It was immediately banned over here in the UK. <laughs> yeah. It was on that Ooh. list of video nasties. Oh, yeah. And for the longest time when the film was released, I think like in Japan and in America, <laughs> yeah. it was heavily censored. There was like at least 30 minutes cut from the film. Oh, yeah. And it was only until, you know, about 20 years ago, really, that they released the in, the film in its entirety. Yeah. When the BBFC were like, yeah, okay, you can let this film pass. <laughs> you, Censors you can have now. This film now. We just weren't ready for it in the 80s, I guess. Oh, yeah. Oh, <laughs> I mean, I don't even know if we're ready for it in 2022, dude. Seriously, like, like, like this movie has made me question everything. I never, I'd never heard of this director before, you know, and I'm pretty sure we fucking should have. Yes, that's like, what, uh, one thing I'm angry like, about. Actually, no. I mean, I've heard of this film before, but not the director. I, I, maybe I've heard of this film, but at the same time, like, when we talk about Sam Neill, this doesn't come up in conversation. I mean, there's probably a few people out there right now hitting the keyboard going, well, I knew about it years ago, and well, I should have said something. <laughs> but seriously, I've watched a lot of shit, ladies and gentlemen. Where the fuck was this when I was doing Tekken 2? <laughs> right? Seriously, where the fuck was this when we were doing Spookies and the fucking Halloween series? Everyone's like, oh, you got everything. I mean, obviously, shout out to the person who told us to do this movie, but man, this director, I, I was really good. I was really good, Gary. I didn't wiki it. What? I didn't wiki it. I, I was getting my notes ready and I was looking at the cast and I was like, you know what? No, 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 no wiki. I'm going to avoid the plot sequence. I'm going to go in there dry. I'm going to go in there blind. But I did wiki The Devil. Ah. And, like, that's a movie I'm interested in seeing and probably plan on never seeing ever in my fucking life. Uh, simply because, like, spoilers, everybody, but it's about a guy who gets kind of followed around by a, a, a nun who's a representation of good and a, a guy in a cloak who's a representation of evil. And the two of them follow him around for pretty much an entire movie until he kills, like, his entire, his entire family because they're all evil. You know, but they're not evil. He's manipulated. And then the guy gets castrated at the end. I don't know. That's why I'm avoiding it. So I read that and I was like, okay, Sam Neill's already told me that this movie was like the most stress-filled, fucking emotionally draining set he'd ever been on. This is fucking Mr. Event Horizon. <laughs> you know, this is Mr. In the Mouth of Fucking Madness. I've seen both of those movies. Possessions never come up in the conversation. No. Nope. So They should. Oh, oh yeah, because because we're going in dry. Like I said, Sam Neill coming home. I like this is set in Poland, isn't it? 
It's it's all shot in Berlin. In Berlin. Yeah. So like we're like it's not dated, but I like to think after well, the war. It, like... It's definitely dated because the Berlin Wall features in the opening of the film, and it's there throughout the entire film. Oh, right, right. And it's another one. I mean, this film is very metaphorical as well. The movie doesn't actually tell you that it's in set in Berlin. I don't believe that. Like the wall is kind of just an urban it's... background of just. Okay, but I mean, also considering the the time this film was made in. In, in yeah, 1980, yeah. Yeah, it, yeah. like it was iconic. It was identifiable almost immediately. Totally get that. But what I'm saying is, like Samuel turns up coming home to his wife uh, Anna, uh, played by uh, Isabella Adjani, um, and we don't know where he's been. Like we're not told like what his job is, no. you know, or what he's been doing for like the last X amount of years. He, we are literally coming back with him into this family life after he's been away doing this. Thing. And the film lets us know. I mean, it's definitely not an error, but we know something's quite odd when we when his wife is there to meet him, and he kind of puts his bags down, picks his bags up, puts his bags down. He's uncomfortable. He doesn't there, know what yeah. to do with his hands. Doesn't yeah. know what to do with his luggage. She's not very like welcoming to have her husband home, and so you know the the the, the yeah. signs are there immediately as to what we're about to get into like before we go too far into this movie i will just say right now i absolutely loved 70 to 80 percent of the cinematography in this movie it was sublime like just the way the director had the camera had the actors in their places and things were going on. I mean, I'll even push to say maybe even 90% taken into some of the things that will fucking happen. Some of those shots were like, oh my God. But the build up, this whole family dynamic of, of, you know, Mark and Anna and Bob, their son. Oh my God. Like children, children, Children hit me in certain stories and this one really hit home because Mark misses his son. He loves his son, but Anna hates him. Does she? <laughs> well, okay, I'll, you go, man, because I got my view on this movie. <laughs> I mean, she definitely, uh, I don't know, there's... It's very hard to read, and I would say that I would believe that Bob has been mistreated. There is also a scene in the film where, you, where it may even imply that Anna has abused Bob. Oh. Especially when, when Mark is holding his boy and he takes his top off and he's holding him. And it almost looks oh like he's looking God. at him yeah. for marks and bruises. Yeah. We don't see it, yeah. but it's oh, implied. Wow, yeah. Uh, but there is scenes much later on in the film where Anna has breakdowns and says that, you know, he is my son too. And the and it is probably the only part that's keeping her at the house right now and instead of just walking right out because, well, she wants a divorce. That's yeah. where this film is going. Yeah. This marriage is already over before the film's even begun. We're just now catching up with these with these characters. Yeah. And and it's all the questions of why. Because Sam Neil Mark is just like, okay, yeah, he's been away, but he's kind of likable he's 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 polite he is i mean there is an aura of something about him but the movie just doesn't tell you i mean i gotta i gotta give that to the director that i was just pulled along by my hand throughout this movie of things sequences that happened and i'm like okay i i think i kind of get what the director's trying to tell me but at the same time i i have no idea i love the sequence where like, the director had taken the idea he'd come home in real life and found his son had been left alone. Um, and he's just sat there eating a pot of jam. So he replicated that sequence in this movie. We see Mark, Sam Neill come home, questioning where his wife has been. She keeps doing this. She keeps disappearing for long periods of time. He doesn't know where she's going. And when she comes up, she's fucking angry and upset. She doesn't want to be there. Well, it's because you know? he's also not trusting of her anymore. And so he starts asking her questions like, who were you with? I was with friends. Which friends? These friends. I checked. You weren't with those friends. So yeah. where were you? Yeah. And yeah, it's and then of course, where were you? she gets caught out in her lies. And so she, again, it's that, that turbulent moment where she reacts violently to being to being questioned because her trust is you know broken yeah um but yeah we should also mention that this film 
was was penned when the director was going through in his in his words a very painful and messy divorce which he wasn't ready for wasn't prepared for and so all of what was happening to him in his real life bled into the script and bled into this film you know probably mixed with some milk and eggs as well <laughs> yeah. yeah yeah but the the domestic scenes in the film are you know they're they're very well captured, but the and the performances are fantastic. But it's going to leave you emotionally devastated. Oh yeah, uh, and this yeah. film will just continue to dial up that devastation throughout the film, and it will. It's very uncomfortable viewing, especially when they start slapping each other around and fighting each other, and all the while, you know, again, whilst these two, while this couple are caught up in their divorce, in their separation, in their mock attempts at keeping uh, a family bob mm. is the one he's the innocent in this who is getting you know abandoned like he is not a priority in their lives for the most part because they're too caught up in themselves yeah, but and each other that's the weird thing i found like i kept questioning where's bob what's bob doing because like at the start of the movie sam neil is he's got to step in he's got to start taking him to to school and to, uh, make sure he's taken care of and cooking his tea and he seems to start to get the life back together you see the teacher now the teacher is the same actress playing the wife right yes but it's a completely different character right yes now, the film <laughs> plays on the motif of doppelgangers throughout. Yeah. And there is something else that we will get to <laughs> later yeah, on. Yeah. That it turns out to be another doppelganger. Um, but now, now, there is like a couple of ways you can interpret this. Now, the way I kind of interpret the school teacher, which, will be, which will be, uh, is known as Helen, yeah. is the fact that Mark is so infatuated with Anna, his, his wife, wife, that... He's... All the women that he sees just has Anna's face. I thought that because exactly. he's a, he's he you know it's again going back to the title of the film is possession. Mm. I don't see it as demonic possession or spiritual possession, but possession that people have of each other. Yeah, and uh, and that he's so possessive of his wife that he literally anyone that he may fantasize about or find attractive or or that he desires. Uh, will have his wife's face. Yeah. And it's the fact that Helen as well is in, in her stature and the way that she presents herself, uh, the way that she is on screen is totally different to Anna. You know, even the hair is different. Um, and maybe what we're seeing is Mark's idealized version of his wife portrayed in this teacher who does want, who is looking after and, and, and interested in Bob, who does kind of return some of his affections. And so maybe that's why that relationship with the teacher does actually blossom throughout the film to the point where they both end up in bed together and he's just like, you know what, I don't actually need to have sex with you. She's like, you don't need to have sex with me. Yeah, and they're both comfortable yeah, and happy true. with each other yeah, yeah. compared to the wife, Anna, who literally says, Mark, you do not please me in bed. I have cheated on you and this person mostly pleased me in bed. So it's again, maybe that is Mark feeling inadequate. Yeah. Maybe I was asking for too much. I was the one who had the right to ask. I know. No, you don't. Who was I doing it for, after all? See, I, I, I also saw it, because when I first saw it, it threw me off. But then I was just like, like I said, I'm, my brain's telling me, oh, he's just seeing his wife there. But then I also kind of liked the idea that she does look just like the wife. But she is a completely different character. That could also be the you know, case. That's yeah. what the, the actress is being put in there. Because like like he, he goes and he meets up with, with Heinrich, uh, played by Heinz Bennant, um, who is supposed to be the guy that has been sleeping with his wife. And there's a terrible fight sequence. I mean, Sam Neill gets his fucking ass handed to him. <laughs> um, but he's also Heinrich is coming on to him. He's like a sexual teacher. Yeah. You know, he's 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 found that Anna was unfulfilled in her relationship and in her marriage. So he's he's had sex with her and blossomed her into this new woman and, you know, found her. And he, that's he, what's breaking her free. But he also doesn't know what Anna's up to because she started no. to disappear from him. It, it, the, the most important thing I kind of got from that scene was that he explains that he doesn't try to change Anna, but he respects Anna the way she is. Whereas Mark yeah, is probably the, trying to control right. her or alter her. 
or want her to behave oh, a oh. certain way, whereas Heimlich's just like, I just love her for the way she is. Yes, there, well, of course a sex therapist is going to say that because he's all just having sex for her while his mum's in the next room. You know, <laughs> Mark's obviously the bad guy, which is part of the story. You know Mark's not the bad guy. In, in fairness, Heinrich looks like the bad guy you know, and the way he beats up Mark and just kind of puts him down, you're like, oh, Mark's being bullied and he's, you know, he's got to kind of stand up for himself. In the meantime, Anna has kept coming back to the flat. You know, we get that terrible sequence where she kind of, what, takes out the clothes from the cupboard. She goes to put them in the fridge. She, like, has, she has a complete, like, mental huge breakdown and Mark is just like look you cannot keep coming back to the flat and disrupting our lives like this what about Bob and I'm sat there like yes what about Bob because he like I said he keeps being dipped out of the the the, the story the narrative as we go and we just got to keep reminded that there's a child involved in this you know breakdown we have uh, uh Margaret and she is kind of, she's a weird character because at first she felt like a character trying to keep Mark away, you know, because Mark's trying to ring her like, where's Anna, where are you? Um, and Margaret was just like, yeah, you know, I, 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 I understand what Anna's going through, much like the sex therapist. I know Anna needs to go away. You need to accept this. But then the more that Anna starts to really properly, properly disappear, Margaret starts to get worried as well because she now has to step in more and look after Bob because Mark and Anna are running all over the place. Well, yeah, I mean, Mark ends up getting so obsessive about finding out what Anna's up to. He ends up hiring uh, a PI yeah. to start tracking her down. And uh, we get that sequence where the PI is actually following Anna and Anna kind of becomes aware that, that yeah. there is somebody following her. And again, there was like it happens really the, quickly. I wasn't I wasn't sure what yeah. I saw, uh, but Anna sort of zips away, and the PI comes r round the corner, round the wall, yeah. and there's a decapitated head on the ground. When he kicks to the wall and, and uh, off frame, before really, he carries I'm, on after her. Shit, I was I missed out. I was still confused by the drunk guy on the train that ate her banana. Right? Yeah. No, <laughs> but it's again, it just does to show it's either the madness that Anna's in or the fact that she's so so zoned out of reality that literally anyone could just take whatever you know one of her possessions and uh, she would be unfazed by it or just unwilling to interact with it or engage with it yeah because she lures the detective into this kind of broken down apartment that she's got uh, well he, he realizes that she's going in there but she hasn't left for a while so he contacts mark and he says look this is the address i'm going to wait for her and he kind of forces his way in to have a look around and there's a fucking tentacle fucking thing on the bed fucking just going at it <laughs> what the fuck is that what the fuck is that <laughs> like all right Let's just get it out of the way. Let's just look at it at the way it is. It's supposed to be some kind of visual representation of her infidelity. And it's not really there. And we're just all seeing it. But she fucking kills the detective with a broken ball. Yeah, and it's almost implied that the thing that's in there yeah. kind of told her to do it yeah. or made her do it. Or, or she's, she's protecting it because she doesn't want people to find out about this thing yet. Whatever like, it is whatever. and whether it's actually there or not. It, this is this thing with this film is that I believe that this film is massively open to interpretation. And however you interpret the film... As I did, yeah. I often found myself contradicting myself with the way I was interpreting the film. And I was like, you know what? I honestly feel like I may not actually possess the entire tool set to break down and analyze this film, but just accept it for what what emotions these characters are giving me as the way this is this madness. Are we I'm... literally just seeing raw emotions just splashed out on the screen here? I, I suppose, but I, at the same time, I started to understand it. And after talking to you before we turned the camera on, I, I like I started to understand it a bit more because especially when the second time you get the you get the the initial the first pr private detective, he's obviously gone, seen this thing. What the fuck is it? Being stabbed in the neck and left in the bedroom. And we get introduced to a second private investigator, or at least the, the first one. The, yeah. the first private investigator is kind of 
gay friend because this guy comes up to Mark and explains that, you know, the, the, the detective hasn't come back and, you know, he needs to find him. And so I, I'm not sure if Mark gives him the information where the address is or he, he, he finds it out for Fallen Anna. But he returns to the flat and as he goes in there, he finds the detective's body, but he also sees this this thing. And this thing, like, was it the hunched over man this time or did it have the eyes? I think it was the hunched over yeah, man. It was, yeah, yeah, it, it was, was definitely more humanoid It was now. more humanoid <laughs> this time. And I'm like, okay, she's fucking growing something or something's fucking growing. This fucking, this thing is fucking Hellraiser like pre fucking hellraiser i mean just like, like the way you've the way i'm visualizing it now is that there is a point in the film where uh she talks about cancer and she talks about god and there is there is a, uh, there's not so much a religion talk in the film mm. but there's definitely the, they bring up spirituality uh and at one point mark says that um it's like a disease and heinrich even says like uh, d- uh having a disease is like the closer or a way to get closer to god yeah and uh, I don't know, maybe maybe the, the monster is a cancer. Maybe it is like a biological cancer or if it is a manifestation well, of the cancer of the divorce see, of the relationship. Well, this is the thing, because th- at this point, like once you've had this thing revealed to you, the whole movie completely takes a complete twist. But like I said, overthinking this movie as, as much as I do when I'm thinking about movies, this thing is still just caught up in this room and is unable to really move where we're still seeing the degradation of the rest of the relationship. Like there is still a heavy impact that this is just this married couple going for a a, a divorce because you see the relationship between Anna, between Mark, between, between Helen as well, where he's trying to kind of move off, you know, like this, whatever this thing is, could be the representation of Anna's perfect man. But we're seeing this, hellraiser type fucking silent hill thing in here to the point where mark even realizes that ah two people have died going to anna's apartment seeing this when the second detective goes into the room and he finds his partner dead he pulls a gun out and he shoots now gary and i discuss this and he thinks one way and i think another i think the detective hits anna but she's protected She's under some kind of protection by whatever this thing is, be it an alien, be it a monster, because it's in the it's in the fucking bed and it's it's still alive. She's fucking it, ladies and gentlemen. She is having sex with it. She tells us it was it was having sex with me all night and it's probably tired. I'm like, you what? You, you did what now? Did you what? You know? <laughs> and so, so Mark even convinces Heinrich. He says, ah, Heinrich, uh, if you want to see Anna, here's her address. You're off you go. And so Heinrich goes over there. And, like, we've seen this thing go through stages. Um, and we see it now with, like, eyes. Or, like, at least a, a lot more of a, a shape to it. I'm pretty, did it speak? It opened its mouth. It would, now, it would, whether it was speaking telepathically it would, or yeah. whether it made a sound. Or... Right. Right. Whether it was actually there. Because right. I mean Heinrich goes immediately blind we upon yeah. upon whatever he saw in that room. Yeah, whether I... it was the carnage of the murders, whether it was whatever it was, he, he claimed he saw God. Yeah. <laughs> like we saw Hellraiser. <laughs> like she fucking she stabs him, doesn't she? Stabs because him she, right in the chest, yeah, or just she, underneath the arm. She's been chopping up the bodies. I think she's been feeding it. The bodies, or that's where she's hiding the body. I mean, voices, you know, Ryan Reynolds movie. I was like, this is what she's seeing. She's right. Like, la la la, I'm away. I do just want to bring up, though, the amazing special effects on oh, this fuck thing. Oh, yes. Uh, it was uh, Carlo Ramboldi who created this monster and, and all of the effects, including some of the tentacle effects and later scenes. Yeah. Um, and this guy would, a year from now, go on to make the, one of the most iconic characters in Steven Spielberg's career, E.T. <laughs> Wait, so this motherfucker made this tentacle monster thingy a year before E.T., E.T., which would go up against the thing. Yeah. This motherfucker should have been working for Carpenter. He should have been. Oh, my God, man. This creature is disgusting in the way it's green eyes open. uh, And green eyes is also something that we've saw in either Helen's character or Anna's character. And, well, later on, Mark will also have those green eyes because this creature will eventually become Mark. Or a doppelganger of Mark, or 
Anna's idealised version of who she fell in love with or who she wanted Mark to be yeah. compared to who we see in the film. Because that's it. The, the whole ending of this movie, Heinrich has Heinrich escaped um, and, and gone to Mark and, and they, they meet up in the toilet, doesn't he? And they, they, they fucking have a fight sequence in the toilet. He fucking kills Heinrich and just you know leaves him in the toilet. And then he... He heads to the apartment himself because now he's got to see whatever this thing is. You know, they've been talking, like you said, spirituality. They've been talking about this religion. And Mark is so in love with Anna. Like, he he likes Helen, but he sees Anna. So he's still in love with Anna. He wants to join with her in this new way of whatever he's seeing. And he walks into the apartment and she's fucking this monster. <laughs> I'm telling you, ladies and gentlemen, like I was, I was sat there, I'd had a couple of beers, I might have not been completely copacetic, but I was like, <laughs> like, like, tell me that shit ain't real. People are like, oh, it's just a representation of her infidelity. I'm like, no, she fucking that weird creature thing. She fucking it. Like, and it's turning into, it's becoming like the fucking invasion of the body snatcher thing. This is going to become our idealized man. And Mark, like, like he's, he's already come across his friend Margaret who had been stabbed. Like he, there was this whole sequence where Anna had go, gone to kill herself with a, a carving blade and Mark's cutting himself with the carving blade and he's not feeling any, anything. And then Margaret ended up dead and he ends up having to deal with the body the same that they've dealt with the private investigators by chopping them up and shit. And so the police or his buddies, like the spy network or the army or wherever the fuck he's worked for, they turn up at the apartment as well looking to investigate what the fuck's going on. The whole time I'm like, where's Bob? <laughs> What's going on with Bob? He's What's... probably in the bathtub. Like, yeah. <laughs> my God, you don't say that, dude. Seriously, don't. <laughs> and there's like a whole fucking shootout sequence toward the end of this movie. Like, yeah, he gets to the back of the taxi, don't he? He's like driving to the back of those police cars. Yeah, and the taxi driver's <laughs> like, okay, mate. <laughs> yeah, the cars end up exploding. The other car ends up reversing out. The body of Margaret ends up flying out of the back. And uh, and he ends up well, getting on the motorcycle and driving away. Yeah, he yeah. He ends up driving to the... I mean, he gets shot at a couple of times. Like, he returns fire and kills some of his old uh, co-workers. Sam Neill, I've got to give credit to him. He, he did a fucking crash sequence on that little harbour bit where he smashes his bike. And I was like, holy shit, he could have died. Well, I'm pretty sure it was a stuntman, but I don't, I don't know. I don't know. I like, <laughs> that's what I'm saying. I, I, maybe, maybe I was so enraptured in the movie and I, I just kept seeing Mark. But at the same time, I kept thinking that 1981, like, what are we looking at? We're not looking at top high spec fucking stunt people there. If it's not Sam Neill, I'd be surprised because it was great sequence to the point where he gets up and he's racing back to the apartment. Like... Like, I didn't realise where he was going at first, but it became apparent to me towards the end. Like, he races up the stairs. He's having this whole gun battle with the, the cops. And he gets up the stairs. He, like, Mark's dying. And Anna turns up with this fucking doppelganger. The, the thing that she's been fucking. And it's Sam Neill, but with green eyes. And so I was like, it's an invasion of the body snatchers. Totally. She made a pod person. She's a, <laughs> she's a pod person. He's a pod person. This is the start of the hidden kind that, of army. Maybe that's the easy way out of this film. Well, this is the I'm, easy explanation. Possibly. Well, possibly. Because the cop, I like it the, the cops shoot up and they kill Mark and he seriously wound Anna. But they do no damage to the doppelganger. So I don't even know if he's there. Because like, if he's there, like the bullets don't go anywhere near well, him. May, he doesn't even maybe, to react. Maybe, maybe not. But for me, a representation of how she'd been shot by the detective earlier in the movie and hadn't taken any damage i'm like this is this is it like like they're, they're immune to bullets they're immune to bullets these fucking weird alien fucking things okay so much like samuel's dying on the floor and his wife's like i like this was like a i hate you so much i'm gonna shoot myself <laughs> and she shoots herself in the back by putting her gun on her back i was like well it's the that's harsh, bitch. <laughs> like, that's harsh. Like, and we cut to 
the teacher's apartment inside the teacher's apartment this is where mark's been trying to get to and bob is here with helen the teacher anna tell him i don't know and the doorbell goes and he's just like don't open don't open and he runs off and she's like, oh, I have to. And he's like, don't open, don't open. And he runs up the stairs. And you watch the little kid run into the bathroom and just climb in the bath and just lay his head down. That shit will give me nightmares. Don't ever, <laughs> ever do that in a motherfucking movie. I don't care. Just don't. He, he knows it's the monster at the door. Well, this, <laughs> right. So there's something at the door, right? What? Yeah, his monstrous dad. <laughs> is it the, the fucking doppelganger we just saw him get blasted at the top of the stairs did we the police, is that what we saw the police turn up the sirens are all going off and it's like world invasion ah well I mean of course like at the time the film was made again like this was the like the height of the cold war like we're right in Germany right next to the war yeah you know yeah. so all of those fears of, of, who uh, goes of there? the end who exactly. is that who do we trust kind of thing yeah like is his mum the teacher, and she always has been throughout the movie, and his dad now is the perfect husband. There are so after, many ways of looking at this film. I, I really think killing it's, people. It is. It is so fascinating. It is a piece of art oh, that man. opens the door to oh. so many conversations. I think it's outstanding. Yeah. Uh, in, in that regard, I, I really do. And yeah, the ending does hit you really hard. Like, to the point where you need time to recover afterwards. But I also think as well, I think that's also what is the film's fault. Um, like, I was really, really thinking about this with this film was... We always say good things and bad things about films. Like a really great, great movie to to one person is really, really terrible to another person. And, you're, and, and I think, well, the movie hasn't changed. But if, the way that people feel. And so the visuals in this movie and plus the... The, the the narrative that can go all over the place, especially the tone, and I think that's intentional. Normally, we're like the tones all over the place in this movie. That's not intentional. It's intentional to this for this movie. I'm I'm sure this movie's supposed to make you feel so fucked up by the end of it. <laughs> you're supposed to question fucking everything that has ever come before your whole life and everything that will be. But at the same time, like I said, I think that's also a fault because some people don't want that. You know. Some people want to know if it's a horror movie or not. If well, it's a yeah, psychological that, it, movie. This or film not. is hard to classify, but it, I mean, I would say it's definitely a psychological horror. Yeah, I'd, I'd definitely I'd say it's a psychological horror, but like I said, that's, that's 2022 now. We've got so many genres now. Oh, of course. You yeah. know, people and people still un, un, are unaccepting of having multiple genres. Oh, is it a horror or is it, you know, is it a sci fi? Is it, it's Kramer versus Kramer with pod people, right? <laughs> it's so fucked up. Well, Ian, what were your favourite or memorable scenes? Oh, man. Okay, right. Let me just, let me just compose myself for a second. I love the sequence in the cafe at the beginning between uh, Mark and Anna where they're talking about splitting and they're talking about what they're going to do, especially with their son. And he actually even says, like, I don't want to see him. Like, I don't ever want to see him. And, she, and she's really upset about it. Like, what? He's so close to you. And he's like, yeah, but you're going to take him off anyway into some random fucking relationship. At that point, I was like, yeah. I didn't know what the fuck was going to happen tonight. <laughs> The sequence where she's just like constantly fucking rubbing her hands just constantly over and over. Like this woman, this actress went mental all the way through the movie. I absolutely loved her. Like the banana sequence with the guy on the train. Like she just sat there and she fucking just took it. Like, like that was normal. You know, the sequence where she's, like I said, she's taking clothes out and she's putting them in the fridge. She's completely breaking down their house. Every sequence, every sequence with that weird fucked up fucking monster fucking thing. Whatever the fuck that fucking thing is. Every sequence with that movie. With, with that monster was fucking sketchy and terrifying. I did not expect it. I was like, hey movie, where are you taking me? And they put me in a room and closed the fucking door. I was like, no, what is it? Like, all the way up to the action sequence at the end. Sam Neill. Uh, Sam Neill is amazing. Yes. Sam Neill is phenomenal. Taking away all the weird fucked up sequences, taking away all the sequences with the wife and everybody else, you just having Sam Neill with his son. Like the 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 drunk sequence at the beginning where he's just completely fucking broken down. Oh yeah. Oh amazing. Just yeah. 
it was mwah. yeah yeah absolutely performances of a lifetime mm-hmm. i think from both the leads in this film there are so many uh great great moments in the film now i say i don't really have favorites um <laughs> yeah. but they're memorable yeah um and I, I there is one quote that i actually that i did uh, i did make a note of uh, and that is near i think it's after the sequence where the where we see uh, uh some videotape footage of anna teaching um ballet class and she literally torments one oh, of her students yeah that was um, to the point up. where, again, it's incredibly uncomfortable. That was fucked up. Um, but she gives her justification for the why she treated that student that way. And it was because it was something that she wished she had had taught to her at a young age so that she would have been better prepared no. in life for dealing with what she's not able to. Yeah. But she says something along the lines of, I can't exist by myself because I'm afraid of myself because I'm the maker of my own evil. You know, and for me, yeah. that is just, it really highlights how self-destructive she is. Yeah. Where she literally will create her own pain and her own chaos because she cannot feel anything. Uh, and, and again, this goes back to a conversation that I really liked. Like three minutes into the film where the two of them are in bed together. Oh, yeah. And, yeah. Uh, and he explains that, you know, he can't feel anything but, uh, but for her. Yeah. And uh, and she's def- you know, we, she basically gives away that she's not reciprocating yeah. uh, these feelings. And it, she pretty much explains that she's not feeling anything for anybody at all. Mm-hmm. And almost an incredibly nihilistic uh, existence is the where we start with, with her character. Well, she does take a carbon blade to her neck, dude. Well, that's another <laughs> one of my scenes, actually. It's, but it's the fact that she screams out. But later on, we see Mark using the same electric sword knife on his arm. Yeah. And he, he shows no no external pain. No. He is completely numb. And, you know, we see this with people at heightened emotional states will self-harm um, sometimes just to try to feel something or something yeah. different. Yeah. Uh, and that is where we're seeing these characters. And so those scenes in this film are portrayed incredibly, incredibly well. Yeah. Now, of course, I do have to bring up this five minute sequence in the film where we follow Anna with her groceries going through this underground and she has oh, yeah. an episode. She has a moment. I don't know whether like you can interpret this as where she is now actually being possessed by an evil spirit, by God, by a demon. Aliens. Or aliens. Yeah. Because this sequence, it, it, it is for me, it is it is the breakdown. It is that crescendo is what all of everything has been leading up to is her having this final mental breakdown with yeah. everything that's happened to her but it's the fact that we it's then the style you know the style over over these actions is obviously she's smashing her milk and her eggs everywhere she's these are things so that you can attri- attribute to motherhood yeah. and her failed motherhood of bob yeah. then it's been interpreted that she is having a miscarriage yeah. throughout the scene when when the blood and the milk starts oozing from her ears from from everywhere and she's just sat in it screaming in agony and this sequence in the film is again incredibly uncomfortable yeah. to watch. Yeah. It's it's abstract, it's metaphorical, but it's real. And it and the emotions coming off this actress are going to stay with you, <laughs> like long after this scene and long after this movie. Like it's not a favorite scene. You say but that. You're not going to forget. It. I told I I totally completely forgot about what we're doing the review until that moment, and now I'm like. Yeah, I don't need to rewatch it ever again. That's just, <laughs> it oh, does no, it needs to be seen again and again so that you maybe go with a different mindset of the way you're going to interpret it or to be open to other... But that's it. It's so <laughs> phenomenal. It's such a great piece that yeah. whatever this actress was going through, and we, we've said it a million times, like, sequences, they just stick with you so much that you go, that's why this movie is memorable. That's why yeah. it's favourite, yeah. Yeah, and you know, this film's two-hour runtime, it literally escalates as it goes. The intensity, the, the, the levels of madness that these characters sink into, yeah. and the way that it is brutally depicted on screen. Uh, it's incredibly, incredibly tight and wrought and devastating. Yeah.
There is only one other sequence that I do actually like. It's kind of a bit lighter in tone compared to what we've been through. But it's also Mark's, one of Mark's breakdowns. And it is that restaurant scene yeah. that you mentioned where, you know, it's almost, it's very peculiar that they're both sat at opposite tables yeah. facing each other. But you've got the mirrors behind them, which they're not reflected in. Um, and oh, uh, yeah. I just thought it was a, a really, really great moment where he, he literally has rage and he starts terrorizing her, yeah. chasing her through the restaurant, yeah, up her, upending tables and chairs, and literally takes all of the staff at this restaurant to pin him down. I was just like, you know, that's that's the human raw reaction to finding out that your lover has been unfaithful to you. You know, the, you know that emotion is just going to burst out uncontrollably like that. Mm. Um, and again, very early scene in the film, which again is just that platform that this film is going to take off from. Incredible, incredible stuff. Yeah. <laughs> Ian, do you recommend Possession? Uh, it's difficult for me um, um, because they, this movie made me question absolutely everything I've ever thought of when it comes to movies um, and it's mainly because like I felt so uncomfortable at the end of this movie yeah. I was so out of place like I said I went in completely blind I didn't know what the fuck was coming and by the end of it I still not entirely sure what the fuck I thought what the fuck it is I watched. I can hear somebody else's interpretation and be like, yeah, I can, I can see that because I've seen it. But I have my own, which I'm like, that's my interpretation of the movie and that's why I'm ne I'm done. Okay, I'm good. I've seen it. Don't have to need to speak about it. We can talk about the visuals and all that. But like, I could never, I could never willingly say to somebody, oh, watch Possession without actually telling them what it is to expect. It, they need to be warned. They need to be warned. And I'm not meaning that in a bad way towards the movie. It's just the movie is so much raw emotion on screen. Like, you thought it was harsh when you watched fucking Iron Man click his fingers at the end of the game and he died. You don't know shit. All right? You thought it was fucking difficult sitting through fucking Street Fighter, The Secrets of Chun-Li? You don't know none, okay? Jurassic Park 3 looks like a fucking walk in the park now compared to Sam Neill walking me through fucking possession. But the thing is, if you love extreme movies and you've never seen it, Go out and go out and watch it because seriously, it'll make you question why you like extreme movies. It's like like why I said at the beginning of the review. That's why I kind of want to see the devil and why I don't want to see the devil because I know what's happening and I think I'm I'm good. You know, if you've watched this review and gone, oh yeah, I can watch Possession, go right ahead. But we warned you, okay? We warned you. If you want to see really great art styles and great directing and great cinematography, it's really good. It's got all of that, but. We warned you. <laughs> well, I'm definitely recommending Possession. This is an incredible film. It's deeply layered, challenging, abstract and wild. And once you've experienced this piece of art house cinema, mm. you will never be able to forget it. No. It's a great window into an examination of the human condition at a point of extreme emotional turbulence that you can't help but be affected by it. You know, just like the manifested doppelganger motif within the film, you'll also be reflecting on them, the other characters, the motives, actions and behaviours, and it's raw. You know, it's uncomfortable, but it's fascinating. Isabel and Jani and Sam Neill gave performances of a lifetime here, so incredibly well portrayed. Even in the over-the-top moments, they retained credibility and authenticity. Yeah. Incredibly well played. The story is relatively easy to follow, <laughs> but it's more of an experience, like something you feel or react to as it plays out. And it's emotionally devastating at times. There's some great music, very impressive cinematography, capturing and framing the domestic fights, the chases. It frames everything in a calculated way. With the uncomfortable close-ups, the wild spinning circles of the camera work, or the rocking back and forth. The monster design and shock of certain scenes will never be forgotten. Cheers, Ramboldi. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously, no, this film is challenging viewing. It's a must-watch for cinema lovers and film fans. It's cosmic horror. It's drama. It's like nothing else you've seen. Murder. Evil. Infidelity. 
madness. <laughs> With aliens, possibly. <laughs> Thanks for watching Off The Shelf Reviews.